Well, good morning, Meadowbrook Church. How are we doing this morning? It's good to see you. It's good to be with you. A special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. I did not know coming in this morning that I was going to have to exercise for the entire church body twice. Um, <laughs> but we, we really do love kids at Meadowbrook Church, and we really love Miss Jackie, who serves faithfully, and she is always looking for volunteers. And so I promise you, if you volunteer downstairs, she will not make you do jumping jacks every Sunday that you're down there. But I do want to say thank you to Jackie, so join me in just saying thank you to Jackie for all the work that, that she does with our kids. Um, so some of you may, if you have kids this morning, may be familiar with a children's author named Mo Willems. Anybody familiar with Mo? This is a picture of Mo. He has a variety of series of kids' books. One of my favorite is a book about this pigeon, um, and it, there's one called Don't Let the Pigeon Drive the Bus. It's all about this little, like, cantankerous pigeon who wants to drive the bus and the bus driver doesn't want him to. He's got another series of books about a pig and an elephant. The elephant's name is Gerald, and the pig's name is Piggy. Uh, and they have this book called Waiting Is Not Easy. Anybody familiar with this book? Yeah, it's a great book, because waiting isn't easy, is it? And I'm going to read it for you. Here we go. Page one. Piggy comes to Gerald and says, Gerald! I have a surprise for you. Yay, says Gerald. What is it? The surprise is a surprise. Oh, is it big? Yes. Is it pretty? Yes. Can we share it? Yes. I cannot wait. Oh, you will have to. Wait? What? Why? Well, the surprise is not here yet. So I will have to wait for it? Yes. Groan, he says. Oh, oh well, if I have to wait, I will wait. I am waiting. Waiting is not easy. Piggy, I want to see the surprise now. I'm sorry, Gerald, but we must wait. Groan, he says. I am done waiting. I do not think your surprise is worth all this waiting. I will not wait anymore. Okay, I will wait some more. It will be worth it. Groan, he says again. Piggy! We have waited too long. It's getting dark. It's getting darker. Soon, we will not be able to see each other. Soon, we will not be able to see anything. We have wasted the whole day. Well, um, we have waited and waited and waited and waited. And for what? For that. This was worth the wait. I know, says Piggy. Tomorrow morning, I want to show you the sunrise. I cannot wait. Sometimes waiting is hard, isn't it? Anybody identify with that? Any kids identify with that this morning? Yeah, sometimes waiting is hard. Now, the reason I took time to read you that book uh, wasn't because I, I didn't know what to say this morning. <laughs> What's interesting is the second half of Romans 8, in some ways, parallels this book, meaning the, the second half of Romans 8 opens up with Paul identifying that our world is full of hardship. He says in verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings, meaning we are all going to face hardship in life. We're all going to face difficulty. We're all going to face pain and suffering. But he says our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed. Meaning one day the glory of God will be fully revealed and all of the things that we experience in the here and now that are difficult will be overshadowed by the glory that God reveals. And there will come a day when our pain will actually pale in comparison to God's glory. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, he says that our pain in the here and now is actually light and momentary when compared to the eternal glory that will far 
outweigh all of it. But the reality is, even though that will one day be the case, in the here and now, we wait. We wait for God's glory to be fully revealed and restored. And it says in Romans 8, verse 19, that all of creation is waiting. All of creation knows that the world isn't the way it's supposed to be, and we all wait. He says in verse 23 that we, all of humanity, is also waiting. And as we wait, two things happen simultaneously. One, we wait and we hope. We have this confidence, we have this assurance that one day everything will be made right, and that hope fuels our waiting. It empowers our waiting. It gives us the ability to go from one day to the next, looking for that day to fully come. Two things happen while we wait. We hope, but we also groan because we have this intuitive sense that the world is not right. We groan because life is hard. Three times in Romans 8, Paul says that we are groaning, which I thought was an interesting parallel to Piggy and Gerald. Three times Gerald groans because he doesn't want to wait. He's waiting for this thing, but he groans in his waiting. And our world is full of groaning, isn't it? I've been groaning for the last two and a half weeks as I continue to watch the media report on the shooting in Texas a few weeks back. In this week, it happened again. Like, I can't watch a full story on the news about what happened in Uvalde without turning away. Like, I can't even watch a full story. I turn away, I leave because my heart hurts so much. This week, it happened again. The teacher, they interviewed a teacher who lost 11 kids in his classroom, and he detailed the events, and he talked about what he said to the kids and how the kids responded, and it just, like, tore me up inside. It's like, this isn't right. This isn't the way things are supposed to be, and I find myself groaning that I want something to change. I want something to be better. I want something to be different. And Paul is saying in Romans 8 that as we wait, we groan, but we also hold out hope. But the question is, what happens when your groaning outweighs your hoping? When your groaning outweighs your hoping and it feels like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I don't know how I'm going to move through this. Sure, I hope for a better day, but my groaning far outweighs my hoping. Well, if you're here this morning and you find yourself in that place, you find yourself groaning and it seems as though hope is nowhere to be found, I think this next stretch of Romans 8 has something to say to you. And this is how this passage begins. This is chapter 8, verse 26. Paul says, in the same way. Now, that phrase, in the same way, is a connecting phrase. Paul is going to connect what he's just about to say to everything that he has said up to this point in Romans 8. And what he's already said by way of review is he said, all of creation is waiting and groaning. He's then said that all of humanity is waiting and groaning, which raises the question, if all of creation and all of humanity is waiting and groaning, what about God? Like, how does God perceive our waiting and groaning? Is He aware of it? Does He know that that's what's going on in our lives? Does He have any concern for it? Maybe He's even apathetic towards it. He knows it's happening, but He's like, nah, they'll figure it out. How is God engaging with our groaning and waiting? This is what Paul says about how God experiences it and what God does in response. Again, in the same way, he says the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Now, what's interesting about this verse is that God names the Spirit, or excuse me, Paul names God in terms of the Spirit in this moment. He doesn't name God in terms of God the Father, nor does he name God in terms of Jesus Christ, but he names God in terms of the Holy Spirit. In part, he's doing that because one of his main emphases of chapter 8 is to highlight the role and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And you see that that's one of his main emphases in chapter 8 when you compare how he uses the word spirit 
referring to God through the first part of the book. If you go back and read chapters 1 through 7, Paul will use the word spirit in reference to God four times in those seven chapters. In this one chapter, chapter 8, he will use the term spirit in reference to God 21 times, highlighting the role of the spirit in your life. So he's trying to show that awareness of and engagement with the Holy Spirit should be a normal part of the Christian life, which for some of us, depending on how we were raised, we might have this view of the Holy Spirit that he's kind of like the crazy uncle of the Trinity, right? Like he's kind of mysterious. You never know what he's fully going to do when he pops his head up. It might be something weird. It might be something kind of different or strange. Some of us have this weird relationship with this spirit because of different experiences we've had growing up in the church or outside the church or with people of the church. But Paul is trying to say, no, the spirit is continually active in your life. To engage with the spirit and be aware of the spirit is a normal part of the Christian experience. There's all sorts of things that the spirit does in your life. He will say early in Romans that it's the spirit who raises you to new life. Paul will say in Galatians that it's the Spirit who produces the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. It is the Spirit who produces these things in your life. He he will say, uh, John will write in the book of John, that the Spirit leads you into all truth. He guides you. He reveals God the Father to you. He illuminates the way forward to you. Paul will write in Ephesians that it's the Spirit who empowers you to live a victorious life. The Spirit is continually at work in our life. The question is, are we aware of it and are we engaging with it? And then here, Paul, essentially what he's doing is he's adding to that list of all the things the Spirit does. And what he's saying is that the Spirit not only does all those things, but the Spirit also helps us. The Spirit helps us, specifically in our weakness. Anybody here ever feel weak? Anybody ever come in here on a Sunday morning feeling weak? Maybe that's you today. You're here and you're like, it took everything I had to get here this morning. And as a culture, we don't do well with weakness, do we? We want to downplay weakness as much as possible and highlight strength and success wherever we can. I mean, we were joking in the office this week because Jackie was wearing a t-shirt that said, I'm fine, it's fine, everything's fine, right? And then somebody in that conversation joked that fine can become the Christian F word because it is this word that we say when in reality, we're not fine. Things are not okay. But we project this image of, yeah, we're fine, it's fine, everything's fine, I'm fine. Why? Because we don't want to admit that we're not. We don't want to admit that we're not okay. We we want to project this image of we have it all together when in reality, we don't. And the New Testament actually tells us and calls us and challenges us to embrace our weakness. We want to minimize it, distance ourselves from it, but the New Testament actually encourages us to embrace it, which for some of us this morning, you might think, like, I would rather die than embrace my weakness. There's a Spider-Man movie, uh, and if you're a Spider-Man fan, you might be thinking, well, which Spider-Man movie? Because in my adult lifetime, there has been like three iterations of Spider-Man. There's been the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man, the Andrew Garfield, and the Tom Holland Spider-Man. Well, this was in 2012. This was the Andrew Garfield trilogy. There's this, the villain in the movie is an evil scientist because it's always an evil scientist. And this evil scientist wants to create a serum, serum that he can inject in himself and become this superpower lizard man. And the reason he wants to do it is he wants to become powerful and strong and rule the world with his mighty strength. And there's this scene in the movie where he's preparing the serum and he's getting ready to inject it. And one of his lab assistants is like, why are we doing this? Why are you doing this? And he said, humans are weak. Why be human when you can be so much more? See, when we deny our weakness, we deny our humanity. And the scriptures say that the thing that God wants us to do is fully embrace our humanity. And one of the ways that we do that in the here and now is we do it through embracing our weakness. 
And what's interesting about that example of Spider-Man is when you contrast it with another story, the Velveteen Rabbit. Anybody remember that? The Velveteen Rabbit sends a very different message. The Velveteen Rabbit is a story of this bunny, this stuffed bunny that was given to a young boy at Christmas. And the question that this rabbit is trying to answer in his life is, what does it mean to be real? How is it that one becomes real? And in this story, the rabbit is in this conversation with a horse. And the horse is tattered and beat up. It's an old toy that has been around for the long time. And the rabbit is pristine and new and shiny and put together. And the rabbit is asking the horse about what it takes to become real. This is the conversation. What is real? Asked the rabbit. Real isn't how you are made, said the horse. It's the thing that happens to you when a child loves you for a long, long time. Not just to play with, but really loves you. Then you become real. Well, does it hurt? Asked the rabbit. Sometimes, said the horse. It doesn't happen all at once. It takes a long time. And that's why it doesn't happen to people and toys who break easily, have sharp edges, or who have to be carefully kept. That's reference to other toys that were mentioned earlier in the story. So generally, by the time you're real, most of your hair has been loved off. Your eyes have dropped out. You get loose in the joints and are very shabby. But these things don't matter at all, because once you are real, you can't be ugly except to people who don't understand. And what's interesting about that is there's this call there to embrace your weakness. Embrace the pain and suffering because we know that there is one who loves us in the midst of our pain and suffering. And this is what Paul is saying, one of the things the Spirit does. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. And in our weakness communicates the love of God to us as we walk through the difficulty and the hardship of life. And sometimes this idea of embracing weakness, embracing pain can be really, really scary. But, but it's also one of the things that help us to fully embrace our humanity. Because we know that God is with us right where we really are. So the Spirit helps us in that place. And then Paul goes on to say specifically how the Spirit helps us. This is what he says in the second half of verse 26. He says, we do not know what we ought to pray for. Ever been in that place? Like, I don't know what to pray for because I'm in this hard place. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. So not only does the Spirit help us, but the Spirit also intercedes for us, especially when we don't know what to pray. I don't know if you've ever been there before, where you find yourself in the middle of a difficult situation, and it's like, this is just too hard to put words together for. I don't know how to articulate what I'm experiencing or what I'm feeling or even how this thing should be resolved. I, find myself, I found myself in one of those places this week. I have this friend who's going through a really hard time. And in part, it's because he's made a lot of really bad decisions with his life. And in the process, he has hurt lots of different people along the way. And I was praying for him this week, and I found myself naturally praying for restoration for my friend. Like, the thing that we should be praying for is restoration and reconciliation, and it should come with the people that he's hurt. But then I found myself thinking, but is that the best thing for the people in his life who he has hurt? Is that really what I should be praying for? And I found myself utterly confused because thinking to myself, I do think they should forgive him because that's going to help them. But even though when we are hurt and we forgive, it doesn't always mean we need to be back in relationship with the people who have hurt us. And I found myself thinking like, God, I don't know. Like, I don't know what's best here. Like, I found myself sitting in this pain that wasn't even mine, just utterly confused, saying, how do I pray for this? How do I pray for healing? How do I pray for restoration? What does that look like? How do I move forward? And my prayer in that moment was, God, I don't know. Like, I don't know what is best in this situation for him and for these other people in his life. I don't know. 
So God, I, I'm naming that I need your help, and I need your Spirit to intercede. And it kind of seems like here, not only does the Spirit intercede for us, but it almost seems like the Spirit also empathizes with us. Because the progression of this passage, is, if you go back to verse 18, the progression of this passage is that all of creation is groaning. All of creation knows that things are not okay. Then we too are also groaning because we have this intuitive sense that things are not okay. And then it says the response of the Spirit is to intercede through groaning. There's this sense in which the Spirit steps into our groaning, picks up our groaning, and brings that groaning before God. The Spirit groans with us. We asked the question earlier, how does God engage in the groaning and waiting we experience? Well, He empathizes. He identifies. He enters into the pain, the suffering, the grief, the groaning of this world, picks it up, and takes it to the Father. You see this all over the place in the Scriptures, right? Sometimes people think God is distant and detached and removed. But regularly and repeatedly, the Scriptures paint this picture of God who comes near. I think it's Psalm 34 that says God is near to the brokenhearted. He comes near to those who are in pain. He comes near to the broken. You most vividly see this in the person of Jesus who steps into our world. He takes on flesh. He takes on humanity. He shows us what it means to be fully human. And one of the things he does as he is fully human is he dies the death we should have died. He, he dies this death on the cross where he takes all of the brokenness of the entire history of the world on himself. He takes all of the sin, all of the suffering and death that comes as a consequence to sin, and he takes it on himself. He doesn't keep himself removed, but he steps into it, showing us how to navigate through it, ultimately to give us hope that there's life on the other side of it. And on the cross, he cries out to God, my God, my God, why? Why? Have you forsaken me? Jesus picks up our groaning in His earthly ministry. The Spirit picks up our groaning and intercedes on our behalf. So if you're here this morning and you're in that place and you're just like, oh, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. You can take solidarity in the fact that the Spirit is groaning with you and taking your groans to the Father. And in the moment, moment, when we don't know how to pray, and the Spirit is interceding for us, this is what we're told happens in verse 27. It says, and he who searches the heart, probably being in reference to God the Father, knows the mind of the Spirit. So there's this mention of now God the Father, the Spirit, taking our groaning to God the Father. God the Father now, it says, is one with this mind of the Spirit, there's this synergy between Father, Son, and Spirit. They're one in community, and they have this sense and solidarity of what's going on together. He knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. The Spirit picks up our groaning, takes it to the Father, and says, I want you to do your will in this person's life. Well, the question is, what is that? What is the will of God? And, and why would the Spirit be asking for God the Father to do His will in our life? What is the will of God? You ever thought of that? S sometimes we like picture it as this divine, theological, magical code. That if we can crack the will of God code, all of our answers, all of our questions will be answered, and we'll have everything we need to navigate life without any issue. And there's all sorts of ways, which I don't think that's what the will of God is. If you read through the Scripture, sometimes it says the will of God is to save and to sanctify. The will of God is to redeem and restore. There's all sorts of different ways that you can define and detail out the will of God. But here in Romans 8, it seems as though the will of God is defined in terms of doing what is good in somebody's life. Because this is where Paul goes next in verse 28. He says, And we know, we know, that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purposes. Essentially, God desires to do good 
in your life. Which means even in hard times, God, through His Spirit, is at work to do good in your life. Perhaps you could say it this way, that God works for our good even in our groaning. God works for our good even in our groaning. Which means verse 28 is a wildly powerful verse. Because it means even in your darkest moment, even in the depths of despair, there's hope. There's hope that God is at work through His Spirit to do good in your life. Now, even though verse 28 is wildly encouraging, it's also a verse that is oftentimes misused. Sometimes it's used to just gloss over people's pain. Right? Oh, don't worry about it. Things are going to get better because God's at work for your good. Well, tell that to somebody whose business just tanked, and they had to file bankruptcy, and they lost everything, and they're hanging out of business on their business door, and they're just like, I, I literally have nothing. What's good in this? Sometimes this verse is also used to kind of un- unintentionally misappropriate people's expectations. Because sometimes it's like, hey, the reason why this business failed is because God wants to give you another one, and it's going to be super successful. Bad things are happening, so good things can come. I mean, there are even preachers and pastors who use that platform in in their preaching to say that God is always going to do good things for you even when bad things happen. But I don't think the emphasis here is about your circumstances. Meaning, I don't think the good that God is doing here is about your circumstances. It's less about your circumstances, and the good that God wants to do in your life is more about who you become. It's less about giving you great circumstances, and it's more about who you become, because the very next thing he says is in verse 29, for those God foreknew, he also predestined which is this wildly massive, somewhat controversial theological topic, which could be God choosing some people on the one hand, right? God chooses those who are in the family of God. That's one way we could think of predestination. But you can also think of predestination as though God has this destination in view, that He is determined beforehand. Like when you go on a road trip, you predetermine your destination, You are predestined to go to a certain place because you've planned a trip to that place. And the destination that God has chosen for you, he says, is this, to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. That God's desire is that we would become like Jesus, that we would be conformed to the likeness of Christ. He has in view that this world is headed somewhere, that the glory of God will be revealed, that we too will be glorified, and we will be conformed to the likeness of Jesus. The good that God does in your life isn't so much giving you everything you want and giving you ideal circumstances, but it's shaping you into the person He desires you to become. I remember my my first couple years of ministry as a pastor were super challenging, super difficult. The first few years were just like gut-wrenchingly hard. I found myself multiple times thinking like, what did I sign up for? Why am I doing this? The staff that I was working on just was, there was no synergy with me and them. Like I, I found myself like disagreeing with the philosophy of ministry and how we were approaching ministry. And I always felt like the odd one out. And I was thinking like, God, like what is this? Why am I doing this? There was even an individual in our church in that season who was trying to get me fired and not have a job. And I'm the type of person who likes to wake up early. Like, I love getting up at 5.30, make a cup of coffee, do some reading, get up before the world gets up. Remember, two summers into this job, it was 8 o'clock in the morning, and I was still in bed. My wife got up, she left for the day, and she could tell that something was not right with me, and she's like, hey, I'm I got to go to work. You're going to be okay. I'm like, I'm fine. I was not fine, right? It's fine. I'm fine. Everything's fine. I was not fine. I'm like, I don't want to face the day. I don't want to get out of bed. Stayed in bed for another 45 minutes and eventually dragged myself out. And I was like, I guess I'm going to go for a walk. It's sunny. It's nice. I'm not going into work today. I don't think I'm going to call in sick. I'm just not going to go in because I do not like this. And so I'm walking the neighborhood and I find two quotes Two things that people have said in my life over the course of that year came up. 
And the first one was, you know the best place where to live? You know where God wants you to live? Somebody said to me once, it's at the end of your rope. Do you know why? Because you have nothing else to do but trust Him. And I remember that. I was thinking, God, I just want to let go of this rope. I don't want to hang on to this rope anymore. I just want to fall. But I remember praying on that walk, okay, God, if, you, if this is where you want me to live, I will live here. I will hang on for dear life because I have nothing else but you. I also was thinking, I called to mind, somebody else told me, do you know what you get when you don't get what you want? experience. I was like, God, I'm getting all kinds of experience right now. And then that friend said, and that experience will change your life. That experience will shape your character. I I can say that I am the pastor that I am today because of that experience and that season I went through. And I got on the other side of it, and I looked back on it, and I said, I wouldn't change a thing. I would walk through it again if I had to because I saw God's faithfulness time and time again in that season of life, sustaining me, helping me, enabling me to give my wordless groans to Him and to learn that He was with me the entire time. See, God works for your good even in your groaning. His good might not be to fix your life, but His good could be making you and shaping you into the person he desires you to be. And Paul kind of shows this in two ways, meaning there's this destination in view that he desires you to be more conformed to the likeness of Christ. That's one way he says it. And the other way he says it is through this idea of being glorified. He says this in verse 30. He says, and those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified, which is that idea of being made right with God. And those he justified, he also glorified. See, sometimes we think this idea of glory is just beauty, it's majesty, it's splendor, it's worship of God, and all of that's true. But Paul is saying, you're caught up in that. God is going to fully restore the world. You are going to be a part of that. You will become the future glory self that God desires you to be. That will happen in your life. It may not happen in the here and now, but you are walking the road to that. So in this place of groaning and waiting, we hope. We hope that one day His glory will far outweigh our pain and our glory, our groaning. And we have hope. And so we continue to walk this road trusting believing that the Spirit is with us to help us in our weakness and is even interceding on our behalf, picking up our groaning, taking it to the Father, saying, do your will, do your good in their life to make them more like you. And the question is, are you willing to keep going? Is your groaning outweighing your hoping today? If it is, the Spirit is with you to help you. And so what this passage does is it gives us permission to groan. It gives us permission to say, I'm not okay. I'm not fine. And one of the things that we used to do before the pandemic was we often um, had prayer available for people after service. Because sometimes we need to be in a place where we can say to another person, I'm not okay today, and I need prayer. And not only does the Spirit intercede on our behalf, but as the church, we should be regularly interceding on behalf of each other. And so, as we move through this summer, our hope is to reinstitute people to be available for prayer after the service. And we're going to do that today. Myself, at the end of service, along with one other person from our prayer team, will be up here just available to pray. If you're in a place where you walked in this morning and you're groaning, and it feels like your groaning is outweighing your hoping, you can come and we'll just spend a few minutes praying for you in hopes of encouraging you. If you find yourself in a place where you're like, hey, I would like to be a part of that ministry, we would love for you to come join our prayer team because there's power in prayer. There's power in community and knowing that I am not in this alone. So may you see that it's okay to embrace your weakness. May you know that the Holy Spirit regularly intercedes on your behalf, even when you don't know what to say. 
And may you trust that God is working for your good, even in your groaning. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for who you are, for the way that you have led us and shaped us in this world. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who has stepped into our brokenness to make us whole. We say thank you for the way that your spirit helps us in our weakness and gives us the courage, the strength, and the power to move from one day to the next. We ask, Lord, that if there are people here this morning who find themselves in deep places of groaning as they wait, that you would minister to them through the body. We love you, Lord, and we pray all this in your name. Amen.